I think the government has tried to do more of the same uh, compared to what they did last time, except their re rhetoric isn't matching their actions. They're stating in the when they stand on the podium of truth that they've adjusted their strategy to better deal with Delta, but the strategy is exactly the same. It's more lockdowns, tighter lockdowns, uh, and Delta's escaped all of their, uh, their MIQ border protections uh, and they haven't got a handle on it at all. And the go government seems to think that they can defy uh, the evidence of the rest of the world that are dealing with Delta. They think that, that uh, vaccinations are the solution. Well, if that was the case, then Israel wouldn't be dealing with the Delta surge India wouldn't be dealing with a Delta surge and the UK wouldn't be dealing with a Delta surge. And the other thing too is the government continues to ignore the evidence, the mounting evidence that ivermectin works uh, as a prophylaxis against COVID. Um, so I think that uh, we're starting to see now uh, the results of that. The Prime Minister isn't turning up every day. She's now sending in other people to do the stand-ups. That suggests to me that they've had focus groups um, tell them that they're um, perhaps not as popular as they thought they were. Well, I've already, always said that what we have is not a pandemic, we've got a case-demic. And we've got, you know, uh, every country in the, around the world has fallen into this trap where they announce cases. But especially with the Delta variant, the vast majority of cases either don't know that they've got the, the, the COVID, um, you know, they need a test to find out that they've got it. So it can't be that bad. And there's also precious few people ending up in hospital, unlike the previous variants. So I think Scott Morrison was 100% correct. We need to stop talking about cases. It's unnecessarily alarming people. And we should actually just deal with the people that need hospital care. And at the moment, we've got something like 150 people um, with with uh, COVID in New Zealand and barely eight of them are in hospital and none are in ICU. So that tells us that this is not as dangerous as has been portrayed, that it's not deadly and that in fact it's highly survivable and that perhaps we need to look at uh, opening up our economy in a far better way to make it more manageable. Oh, it's a very good point. We've had all of these people go through MIQ. Plenty of them have been diagnosed as having Delta. None of them have needed hospital level treatment. The first person who really needed hospital level treatment was the Fijian uh, UN worker who flew in here. And then just a few days later, we get an outbreak of Delta. So, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to start working out where a few of these weak links are. Um, but the reality is, is we've got hundreds of cases now in New Zealand, only eight people in hospital, and of those, none are in ICU. So it's not as bad as has been made out, and you know, the government and Jacinda Ardern in particular are just scaring, um, scaring people unnecessarily. I think Nationals got the same problem they had when Simon Bridges led them and we ended up in lockdown. And the government is, has, you know, absolutely uh, used this yet again shamelessly so that they can dominate the airwaves. Uh, there is a slight difference now is that the population isn't, I don't believe, is, uh, is actually uh, as compliant as they would like to th believe they are. In the first lockdown, there was hardly anybody driving around. It doesn't, you can... You can go around Auckland and there's hundreds of people driving around. So it's uh, a lot less uh, strict. People are not adhering to the rules. And I think people are just sick to death of hearing about it and are turning off. And consequently, they're not listening to the, to the Prime Minister. That said, I think National needs to start talking directly to people via Facebook or via Twitter or, or um, using the BFD, for example, to talk directly to um, its supporters so that they can get the messages out there, the key messages that the government's border uh, MIQ policies have failed, that their lockdown policies are failing, that they're not going to eliminate uh, the virus, that we actually do need to uh, start learning to live with it. 
And I think those are key messages that people will start saying, hallelujah, we've got a, a, an opposition here that, um, that we can listen to and would make a good government. I believe ACT are making a huge mistake. David Seymour has been out uh, travelling around the country talking about freedom of speech, um, free, freedom of association, all of these sorts of things. He's called himself a classical liberal, and yet he's vociferously supporting uh, the use of the government snitch app. Um, he wants compulsion um, with vaccines. He wants compulsion with using the, the uh, government snitch app. These are in stark contrast to his libertarian and liberal credentials. And I think it, it's um, causing some dissonance amongst the supporters that are saying, well, hang on a second, I thought you believed in freedom. It turns out that he's actually, uh, you know, a, a, a closet fascist underneath. I believe that ACT is being dishonest with voters. They were dishonest with um, firearms owners before the election. They went and got a couple of people to signal that they were supporting firearms owners. In personal discussions that I've had with David Seymour, he um, just treated treats shooters and firearms owners with complete disdain. He won't raise anything about it. He thinks that as an issue has gone and disappeared and he's just shamelessly hoovered up those that support. I think he is being dishonest and trying to uh, con centre-right voters into thinking that he's got the answers. And uh, yes, I do believe that um, when push came to shove, if um, he could form a coalition with Labour, then he would do it. Um, and then all of those people who voted ACT because they want to have a centre-right government will end up with a Labour-led government, with David Seymour acting as a nodding dog to their policies of compulsion and forced vaccination. Yeah, they'll have a small impact, and that will be to take votes off the centre-right that will be wasted, and whatever votes they get will largely be split 50-50 between Labour and the National Party. The new Conservatives are uh, frankly uh, discredited. They're largely a bunch of uh, single-issue type people that are really focused on binding citizen-initiated referenda, but they're the sound of one hand clapping but they do have an effect because a 4% vote for a new Conservative, then that gets split um, between the, uh, the two largest parties and it could be the difference between forming a government and not forming a government. I get asked this question a lot. They're saying, what will it do to bring down this government? And the answer is nothing. We've got an MMP uh, environment where uh, the Prime Minister or, um, goes to the Governor-General and says that she has, the, uh, she has the confidence of the House. They have a majority outright. The voters of New Zealand stupidly gave them a vote, uh, uh, an outright majority. There is literally nothing that will bring down this government short of a schism within the Labour Party. And turkeys don't vote for early Christmases. So the chances of there being an early election uh, the chances of there uh, being something that's going to happen that's going to uh, bring us bring down this government uh, are very, very remote. Uh, even if a couple of cabinet ministers uh, get, get caught in the back of a sheep or something like that, they're never, ever going to bring down the government. They'll be sacked, um, they'll be replaced, and the government will sail on. And the only thing that's going to eventually bring it to an end will probably be Jacinda Ardern deciding this is all getting too hard, I don't think I can win, so I'm going to bail out now. <laughs>